Hi, I'm James Conner, and I want to thank you for joining us today for our virtual Copper Conference. At the UN's Climate Change Conference, 120 countries signed a pledge to triple renewable energy capacity by 2030. This increase in renewable energy will require a significant increase in demand for copper. A traditional gas car uses 50 pounds of copper versus 150 pounds for an EV. An onshore wind turbine will require more than 2.9 tons of copper per megawatt of power. Solar panels will require 2.8 tons per megawatt of power. But is there enough supply to meet this growing demand in copper? The world's largest producer, Chile, is responsible for 25% of global copper production. But its production peaked in 2018 and has been declining ever since. Goldman Sachs said they now expect copper to hit peak supply in mid-2024, generating deficits from that point on. Both Goldman Sachs and Citibank are both forecasting the copper price to increase from the current level of $8,800 a ton to $15,000 a ton in 2025, an increase of 70%. How can we take advantage of this upward move in the copper price? We've assembled some amazing speakers and industry experts to answer this question. Our conference begins with Steve Shovstall of Sprott Asset Management, followed by Gary Thompson, Erickson Metals, Stefan Iono of Cormark Securities, Paul Harbage of Faraday Copper, Irfan Kasimi of Horizon Copper, John Chapelli of Sprott Asset Management, and we conclude with Charlie Johnson, BHP Explore. If you can't watch the conference in its entirety, you can check it out anytime on our YouTube channel, Bloor Street Capital, where you can listen to it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I want to thank our corporate sponsor, Spronic, a global leader in precious metals and energy transition investments. I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much for joining us today. Global investment in the energy transition movement has surged in recent years, and Sprott has created a number of investment products for investors that take advantage of this movement. And Sprott recently created a new Copper Miners ETF. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this ETF and what the catalyst was for creating it. Absolutely. The Sprott Copper Miners ETF, ticker COPP, is our latest offering in our energy transition suite. Uh, this suite is actually dedicated to the growing trend toward cleaner energy uh, that we're seeing from governments around the world. Uh, if you look at the COP28 conference, which is that annual climate conference that the UN puts on every year, just this past December, we actually saw 118 nations uh, sign on to triple renewable energy capacity out through the end of this decade. And what that looks like from a real perspective is we're actually starting to see lots of investment go into the energy transition. Uh, so we're we're moving past just talking points. So if we look at 2023 as an example, uh, we see about $1.8 trillion was invested globally in the transition to cleaner energy, uh, which represents about a 17% increase over 2022's number, uh, which was also up significantly from the prior year as well. So we're seeing this uh, th these large amounts of investments enter the space uh, as it relates to not only how we produce and, and consume energy, but also how we uh, store and transmit energy. And that's really where copper comes in. Copper is kind of that Swiss army knife of uh, critical minerals in that it's really involved in all aspects of not only the clean energy transition, but also anything that has uh, electricity is uh, likely to contain at least uh, some amounts of copper. So what we see when we look at the longer term uh, view of, of copper and what we see from a supply and demand dynamic is this overhanging a shortage of uh, new copper hitting the market. So if we look back throughout all of human history, when since we've been mining copper, we've produced around 700 million tons of copper. Going out through 2050, uh, we're going to have to produce about 1.4 billion tons. So about two times of the copper will have to come out of the ground and hit the market over these next 27 years than we've produced throughout our entire existence. And so that's a tall task in any industry uh, to start to bring that much more uh, product to market. But particularly as it relates to the copper industry, we have uh, several issues that are, are really hamstringing the, the ability for the industry to supply uh, this growing demand. Uh, one would be the amount of time that it takes actually to get a new copper mine up and running. So if you look from the time from uh, when a new copper deposit is 
uh, actually identified and, and goes through the permitting process uh, until it actually begins producing. It takes on average about 16 and a half years to actually get a new mine up and running and producing in any meaningful way. Uh, second, we're also seeing um, significant uh, issues as it relates uh, to uh, getting uh, copper out of existing mines. So through the last 150 years or so, we've actually seen ore grades are steadily declining uh, and copper producers are having to move much more material just to get the same amount of copper out of the ground that they uh, were able to do previously. So what this causes is these copper miners either have to dig deeper into less copper rich uh, material or they have to move to more re remote places of the globe, uh, which has its own logistical and, and supply chain considerations. Yeah, you raised many interesting points there, and uh, especially about the production levels of copper. Kudelko, the world's largest copper producer, has been suffering from lower production numbers here in the last few years. They can't replace their reserves fast enough. BHP and Rio Tinto continue to look for large size projects and they can't find any. And another interesting aspect that's really happening in the industry right now is even the gold miners are looking for large copper assets. And Newmont, the world's largest gold producer, and also Barrick are both looking for copper assets and they can't find any. Yeah, and you know, this is what we're starting to see. We're seeing um, not only as it relates to copper, but other critical minerals as well. Uh, we're starting to see producers try to diversify uh, what they're producing. We see oil and gas companies moving into lithium. We see gold producers uh, striking out onto uh, uh, copper. And even in some cases, we're seeing lithium producers actually uh, with some uranium assets uh, that they're looking to bring to market as this transition moves forward. So we're at a pivotal point now where I think miners are trying to find how best they can you know, bring their operations up to speed and really produce what uh, the, the world is showing them that we're going to need over the next 25 or 30 years. And Steve, how many names are in the Copper Miners ETF and what's the breakdown between producers, developers, and explore codes? Yeah, uh, COPP is a pure play strategy. Um, and what we mean by that is to be eligible, eligible to be included into the index, um, any of the companies have to have at least 50% of their revenue or assets tied uh, directly to either the mining or exploration or production of copper. So what that really leaves us with is about a universe of 40 names. Uh, of those 40, we see 25 would be producing companies. They make up about 92% uh, of the portfolio. Another 15 would be non-producers or more of those exploration type companies. Uh, they make up about 8% of the portfolio by overall weight. Uh, the fund actually also has a, a tilt toward large caps. So about 51% of the index is dedicated to large cap equities, 39% to mid caps, and the remaining 10% or so is de uh, devoted uh, to small cap companies. The uh, total market cap of the entire index is about $250 billion. So again, owning to that large cap tilt. Uh, and the weighted average market cap of the constituents in the index is about $23 billion. And uh, when we look at the country of domicile of the individual securities in here, uh, we see Canada and the United States combined have about a 63% allocation uh, with, with uh, you know, a, a lean toward Canada there. And then Chile is going to have about 11% allocation. So combined, we're looking at about 75% uh, allocation to those three countries based on uh, companies' uh, domicile region. And Steve, I just want to reiterate one point you just made. 63% of the weighting comes from Canada and the U.S. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's especially important now, given all the geopolitical situations we have happening throughout the world. That, that's right. And what we see, you know, in Canada, United States, and, and you know, other tier one mining jurisdictions is not only uh, do they tend to have the, you know, the, the leaders in the regulations and, and what's required for a miner in those locations, but we tend to see that they're looking to bring these materials out on a more sustainable way. Uh, and that's something that as the transition progresses and we start to see uh, these critical minerals and, and the production start to move toward uh, Western countries and Europe and, and the United States, Australia and, and Canada, uh, we expect to see um, these tier one mining jurisdictions take a more prominent role in producing these metals as we move forward. And what are the top three weightings within the ETF? Yeah, absolutely. So Freeport, which is uh, one of the largest producers of copper in the world, makes up about 21% of the index. Antifagasta, which is a, uh, a UK-based uh, company, a, a large copper producer, has 11% allocation. And then we look at a firm like Southern Copper, which 
has the world's largest copper reserves. Uh, they actually have an eight and a half percent allocation to the portfolio. So uh, th these are large producers in in the the copper world. Um, but owning to our pure play strategy, what we see is that not only are these large copper producers, but they're also pure play producers, meaning that a lot of their revenue is coming directly from copper. And in some cases, uh, it could be you know up to seventy or seventy five percent or more. And Steve, can you speak to the strategy and what makes the Sprout ETF different from other copper ETFs? Yeah, it's it's really a, uh, quite a simple story. It really comes down to that that pure play uh, notion. So just finding those companies that are actually dedicating their resources and, and getting and having their assets dedicated to copper in this case. Uh, so the last thing we wanted to do was was create a portfolio that would be full of uh, much more diversified miners. When we create a new ETF. We really look for ways that we can add value by going in and doing all the research ahead of time so that we can work with our index providers, NASDAQ in this case, and provide a quality index uh, that is actually you know, what we feel to be representative of the, the copper uh, miners uh, investment opportunity. So what, what we see is uh, we're, we're left with a portfolio where we actually have 100% of the exposures dedicated to copper equities. Uh, if you were to look at some other strategies, uh, you might see that dip somewhere down closer to, you know, 60 to 65 percent dedicated. So much more uh, larger, more generalist type uh, of diversified miners in some portfolios. And then we also have a, a very low level of overlap amongst some other investment strategies. So we typically see um, amongst other portfolios that are available about a 55 to 60 percent overlap uh, somewhere in that range. So uh, very differentiated from that standpoint. But again, it's it's that pure play approach that really sets the strategy apart. And where can investors go to learn more about the Copper Miners ETF and the other Sprott products? So investors can go to SprottETFs.com. Uh, so there we have information our, on our entire energy transition suite. We also have white papers and monthly market commentaries addressing uh, many aspects of the energy transition uh, on our website as well. Well, that's a great overview and thank you for making the time. Thanks for having me. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Vancouver? Yeah, doing well, Jeremy. Good to see you again. So let's talk about Brixton Metals. It's an exploration company with four projects, but in the interest of time, I want to focus on your most advanced project, and that's the Thorn Project. It's a copper, gold, silver project located in northern BC. We have seen so many examples of where jurisdiction has been an issue with mining companies here in the last year. Maybe you can just touch on the mining industry in northern British Columbia and what other mining companies are operating there. Sure. Well, there's been a lot of activity in and Northwest BC. I think the budget was just under 400 million in British Columbia spent last year, and most of that was spent uh, in in Northwest British Columbia. Uh, I mean, you've got a, a number of the majors in there. Tech's been a long-term operator. Uh, Newmont now, with the uh, merger with Newcrest, is uh, one of the largest landholders in Northwest BC. Of course, uh, with Brixton Metals and now with BHP uh, taking a foothold. Uh, that brings you know another major to uh, to the area. Um, so you're seeing a lot of um, you know a lot of activity uh, still still dominating in British Columbia from a, a spend perspective, and I think that that will continue. It's you know it is a good jurisdiction, and and there's you know a lot of um, a lot of uh, high grade copper gold deposits in Northwest BC, and obviously several active mines and several other mines on the uh, you know on on the docket for development. And a related point I want to touch on is the importance of social licensing and maintaining a positive relationship with local communities. Maybe you can just touch on that, what you and your team are doing. Yeah, that's been a big, uh, you know, a big focus for us, um, more so the last few years for sure. Um, the First Nations are becoming, you know, more uh, involved. And I, you know, I'm proud to say that our last, uh, last season was a record number, something like 67% of our employees were work either work directly for Brixton or through contractors that were First Nations uh, companies and so we're you know we're certainly um, uh, working to bring uh, bring in the First Nations uh, as partners and uh, involvement in the project so it's yeah it's looking pretty good it's certainly uh, an important aspect uh, you know to um, 
to make these projects go and, and getting the social license as we've seen, you know, in, anywhere around the world now, it's, it's um, becoming a um, hot topic, I think, and certainly uh, putting a lot of resources into, uh, you know, building those long-term partnerships. So let's talk about Thorn. It's a very large project and it also has a very rich history with many other miners involved before Brixton got involved. Maybe you can just speak to this and give us some idea of what's been going on there in the last 10 plus years. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to 1952 was the original discovery and you're right, there was I think a dozen previous operators, but you know, we've been spending pretty considerable uh, you know, budgets uh, this year, we're, we think we have about a $12 million budget minimum. Last year we spent over 14. Uh, so our budgets have been certainly increasing uh, over the years. And, you know, it's still it's still relatively early stage. I mean, we've made some, I'd say, meaningful and significant discoveries, both for copper, like in the Camp Creek discovery, but also the Trapper Gold target. We've had a few seasons drilling on that. A pretty, pretty interesting gold target. So there's been numerous discoveries uh, that, that we've made um, and we're still finding what's remarkable about, remarkable about the project is that we continue to find new mineralization, new areas that um, I guess that haven't been, uh, we haven't drilled on certainly. And, and I think that's one of the exciting part. Uh, we continue to uh, work up some of these targets and some, you know, maybe perhaps overlooked um, when you've got something over there that's uh, shiny and exciting, um, you kind of skip skip over maybe what's closer to to home and so we've we've started to come back a little bit and I look a, around like Camp Creek outside of that maybe there's something you know nearby that um, we should take a closer look at and so we've been uh, doing that and yeah I think we have like three other outside of the Camp Creek copper porphyry which is an exciting you know deep target that we can talk more about uh, we've got a number of other probably two or three other targets like the north target that we're starting to do some more work on um, the trifecta area, which is a, uh, again one of these ones that I think kind of got overlooked, but um, worth uh, taking uh, taking a shot on. And then we have another area called Cirque, uh, which is several kilometers uh, to the east of the Camp Creek target. It looks like another porphyry center out there that um, well, had some historical drilling and some interesting samples. And I think that, again that one's kind of got overlooked. And I think the reason is that there's a younger volcanic cover that covers part of this area. So it's somewhat masked. Um, so it's not an obvious uh, showing, uh, and not as enough, maybe not as many showings that you'd like to see <laughs> perhaps. So it's, it's one of those ones I think we're, we're gonna take uh, take a closer look at and, and you know do some drilling on. And I also wanna give the viewers a, an idea of how large your land package is. How many hectares is it? Yeah, it's grown. Um, you know, it's easier to use the square kilometers. It's 2,880 square kilometers. Um, so we're talking about an 80 kilometer trend in the northwest, southeast direction. And then if you look at the central part, we probably have another 30, 40 kilometer, sort of an east-west kind of a cross trend in the central part um, of, of the project. So, you know, we have uh, many targets uh, that we're looking at. These are multi-kilometer scale uh, copper geochem anomalies and and look at most of the most of these targets um, we certainly haven't drilled some of them I'd say probably you know 30 percent of them maybe 40 percent of them have had some initial drilling you know back in the day from some of the early operators but you know most of that drilling was was really shallow in some cases you know 20 30 40 meter holes just testing for um, you know something and yeah I would say most of these targets have not been drilled and Again, that's the exciting part. Uh, we've got a lot of targets to uh, you know to test, and you know we're we're looking to make that big discovery, right? We want to get you know a big uh, a big new copper uh, drill hole uh, behind us in, in a new area that hasn't seen much drilling. And I think again, that's the exciting part of the Thorn project. That there's there's a lot of targets to chase, and and you know we want to we want to um, yeah see see what we can pull out of the hat this year. So you made mention of the fact that 2023, you had a very extensive drilling campaign. Maybe you can just touch on the highlights and what targets you were focused on. Yeah, 23 was uh, really two targets that um, got most of the drilling attention. Camp Creek, we had uh, two uh, drills, deep, drilling deep holes. We drilled a half a dozen uh, deep holes in, in Camp Creek. 
um, for the copper porphyry and we're drilling the deepest hole there was uh, 1650 meters. Um, we had a hole that was uh, 277 that drilled down to about 1000 meters. Uh, we're getting into 0 0.7, 0 0.8 copper grade and we got stuck in the hole. So that's uh, actually quite well set up for um, drilling that now. We've got casing down to about 900 meters. And so we're going to do a wedge hole off of off of that in, into Camp Creek. So that's you know 2024 plan. Um, we drilled a series of holes into the tracker target, uh, trying to uh, expand that uh, gold anomaly. Um, so if you look at the overall program last year, it was about 10,000 meters in Camp Creek, and about uh, just under 7,000 meters at, at Trapper. And in addition to that, we took about 3,000 rocks and soils. Um, all, all over the property. And we even got down to the south end of the property, which has um, some interesting gold anomalies. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time on the eastern uh, copper anomaly. That's a new area that, again, we haven't drilled yet. There was some historical drilling out there in the 70s and 80s, um, pretty broad scale copper anomaly. So we're just, and the north target again, got more work. So it's it's working these uh, targets up to a point where, where you can drill them and and I think, yeah, I think this year is going to be going to be one where um, we can test some of these now that we've been working on for the last few years. Gary, let's talk about your 2024 drilling campaign. Now, it's also going to be very large. Are you also going to focus on the same two primary targets, the Camp Creek and the Trapper? Yeah, I mean, I think we're targeting for about 15,000 meters this year in 2024. Um, we're still working through those specific targets and you know we're not going to be planning all the holes out of Vancouver I think you know we're going to have a handful of holes uh, we're looking at you know three or four holes probably in Camp Creek uh, and sort of meterage wise you know probably similar eight to maybe nine thousand meters or something in Camp Creek but uh, I'm not sure about Trapper yet I think while it's an interesting target there's so many other targets that we would like to test um, and so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be drill testing some new copper potential discoveries that um, we haven't drilled yet, and I think that's kind of the exciting part. So trifecta is one that we're interested in, uh, just south, sort of between Trapper and, and Camp Creek. Um, the SERP target, which is uh, you know three or four kilometers out to the east of Camp Creek, and then the north target, which is uh, obviously up to the north, um, it's also a large area. Uh, it's about a 15 kilometer geochem uh, trend. So those are three that that I think is on, on the list. Um, there's others that we could drill, but the goal is to get in there, uh, hopefully mid-May we're drilling, um, and then see, see what we get out of the first part of the season, and that'll drive sort of what we do, where we drill, uh, you know, for the rest of the season. I wanna move on now, Gary, and discuss BHP's involvement. Uh, they first got involved in 2022, and their primary purpose was to advance the Thorn Project. And there's a lot of copper exploration companies operating within British Columbia. What was it about Thorn that BHP liked? Well, yeah, I mean, they're 19.9. Uh, they've they re-upped re in the last um, financing we did at the end of last year, 14.5 million. So they participated in that pro rata. Um, look, I think what they see, the potential for, for Thorn, I mean, good jurisdiction. Um, we've got a, you know, one of the largest uh, mineral claim holdings in British Columbia. Um, and it looks like we've got a complete mineral system here. And if you just look at our, our materials on our, like a geochem, uh, copper geochem map, you can see the scale, the scale of the geochem uh, signature that, that it's evolving to quite a large system. And I think we're all excited about uh, drill testing some of these new areas that haven't seen any drilling. So I think that we're dealing with a you know discovery rich, target rich uh, project that has scale, and we believe it. We, we believe it has grade, and that scale and grade opportunity, um, you know, provides that uh, long term. You know, we're calling it a multi generational opportunity. Why is because we believe we've got more than one uh, mineralized porphyry center. We've got multiple centers. On the project and the potential for not only one long life mine but multiple long life mines so there's a unique opportunity here in, in brixton at thorn for you know for all, all all the locals to benefit and obviously shareholders and, and stakeholders alike to to benefit from a, a long-term uh sustainable project and how involved is bhp in picking targets and also determining 
the direction of the drilling campaign? Yeah, so Brixton and BHP have a technical, joint technical uh, committee that's been established when they uh, initially invested. So we meet on a regular basis. Uh, we just had a, a full day technical meeting, a post uh, PDAC. And I would say, you know, we're, we're, we're aligned. I mean, we're all shareholders here. We're aligned in that we want to we want to find the next big copper discovery um, or make the next big copper discovery. And uh, so looking at all the data and, and yeah, they've been generating some ideas. We've been generating some ideas. We're, we're throwing them back and forth to see, uh, see what sticks and, you know, uh, you know, where the opportunity, where the best, I mean, we always look at this every year. If you've got a little pot of money, what's the best use of proceeds? What's the best bang for your buck? Um, and, and, you know, at the drill bit. And I think we're aligned in that perspective and, yeah, we're we're all looking forward to uh, you know to getting out there and and you know getting the drills turning. So let's move on and discuss your balance sheet now. You touched on earlier that you did a raise in late 2023. How much cash do you have on hand, and how will you allocate that cash in the coming season? Yeah, we're we're north of uh, 15 million. I think we ended the year uh, with about 19 million in in the bank, and and we're going to have at least 12 million dollars uh, that's going to go into Thorn this year. Um, I think most of that's going to be drilling. Um, we're looking at doing some geophysics uh, up on the north target, and again, more more geochemistry, more mapping. You know, like a, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of additional analysis that we're doing, like the TerraSpec alteration, the XRF, um, uh, physical property measurements uh, on the core. So there's a lot of a lot of extra uh, data collection that we're doing. So that adds adds a bit to the cost, but. I think overall, um, yeah, it's going to be most of the money is going to be on on the drilling, and um, yeah, see what um, let's see what we can generate from you know from the drill bit. So far, we've just been focused on your project in British Columbia, but you have another project in Montana. It's called Hog Heaven. Your partner there is Ivanhoe Electric. Maybe you can just give us an update on what's happening there. Sure. Well, Ivanhoe Electric is actively drilling. Um, they're they're basically testing. Uh, they recently published um, their Typhoon geophysical survey. They've been they've been drilling um, pretty extensively for the last uh, 18 months, I guess now. And uh, so they're they're on site. They're drilling, uh, basically testing for uh, a large what looks to be a large copper porphyry system. Uh, so far, their results have been encouraging. That shows a a big footprint um, of a large mineralized system. Um, but also some fairly long um, mineralized, uh, we'll call it high sulfidation mineralization. So they've yet to really tap into the copper porphyry part of the system. And I think with this recent uh, typhoon results, uh, that's going to drive uh, the next round of drilling. And so fingers crossed that they, you know, they, they drill into uh, what we think looks like could be a quite a large copper system. Um, so uh, keep an eye on, on the Hog Heaven project. I think that's going to be one to watch. We're excited uh, to see what what they can uh, come up with as far as a copper numbers on on this target. Gary, I want to summarize many of the points that you have said. Brixton is located in one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world, where the rule of law still dominates. You own a massive land package, which can lead to scale, and that's what mining companies want now. They want to they want to be able to find a mine life that's going to last. 50, 75, or 100 years. And this is one of the reasons why BHP got involved. And what else am I missing? Well, I think that's it. I think it's a, it's a discovery rich environment. We've got broad scale copper anomalies that have yet to be tested. So it's certainly, uh, we're an exploration copper play. I think if you want exposure to uh, copper, we're still valued. You know, we're less than 50 million market cap. Um, so we've yet to uh, turn the dial, I think, on, on, on the momentum. And that's what we're gunning for this year, planning to drill some, some big copper holes. And so certainly keep an eye on, on Brixton. And you've already touched on a lot of detail on what you're going to do in the upcoming drilling campaign. But maybe you can just summarize for our viewers what they can expect in terms of news flow in the coming months. Yeah, so we plan to be uh, drilling uh, mid-May. Um, so I would suspect given timeline turnaround. So June, I think the, the news should start flowing perhaps towards the end of June, and then a steady flow of uh, drilling results from there till, till the end of the year, uh, perhaps in, into uh, 2025. And then also uh, we can expect some news flow to come out of uh, Ivanhoe Electric on the Hog Heaven project um, throughout the year. 
of course, uh, you know, Ivanhoe Electric is the operator, so um, we'll just have to keep an eye on, on that as it comes in. Well, Gary, that was a great overview, and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today, and I look forward to an update at some point in the future. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck in the upcoming season. Thank you very much. Did you know that 80% of our viewers are not subscribers to our channel? So be sure to subscribe to the channel and help us put some food on the table. Stefan, thank you very much for joining us today. Copper is finally making a move here with the price firmly above $8,800 a ton or $4 a pound. And it's being driven by both demand and supply challenges. And I want to start with the supply side first. A big part of this movement that we've seen lately has to do with treatment charges in China. And maybe you can just expand on that and tell us exactly what these treatment charges are and why it's impacting the price. For sure, for sure. Well, thanks for having me. And yeah, so treatment charges, when we think of treatment charges, we're talking about the smelters. And effectively, you can think of the smelter as this, the middleman in the, in, the, in the chain from mine production through to finished copper, what we call refined copper. And so smelters buy copper from the mines. It's usually in the form of a concentrate. And then they, the smelter itself will process that copper concentrate into a finished refined copper product you know, usually in the shape of a, you know, pure copper sheet or bar or some other form that then the likes of Tesla or Apple can purchase it and make stuff with. Um, and so what we've seen here is the smelters um, get very aggressive with one another and undercut each other in terms of trying to, su to, trying to su source um, mine supply to fill their own smelters with. And in, in, in the process, they've been undercutting each other so much so that now the smelters own profitability has profitability has come into question. And to sort of maybe put some rough numbers around it, you know, typically or historically, smelters charge somewhere uh, on the order of 60 to 80 dollars a ton in what we call a treatment charge. Um, and that number is because again, smelters are competing with each other so aggressively, that number has dropped all the way down to the likes of $10 a ton. And again, the lower the treatment charge, the less profit the smelter makes. And so that obviously affects the bottom line for the smelters. It's caused them or prompted them to step back and start talking to each other and say, hey, we got to stop this as a group. And so the, the Chinese smelters have now come to at least a loose or a, a, a qualitative agreement um, to cut back purchases from mines um, in effect to get treatment charges higher. And so in effect, um, what what's happening to the overall price of copper, if the smelters are producing less refined copper, that then... Uh, signals to the market that there is just less copper out there. And so the copper price intrinsically goes up for the likes of, again, Apple, Tesla, whoever's using it as an end product user. So let's talk about that. Why can't they get enough supply for these smelters? What's happening? Sure. So a couple of things are happening here. The mines are, are producing, I'd say not an exorbitant amount of more copper, um, but what we've seen is you know, there's a there's a, a very compelling macro narrative on the copper space now that's emerging. I think most people are in agreement with it, and we're seeing it in our daily lives. Um, you know, you, you drive down the highway and you're seeing Teslas everywhere now and charging stations and the idea of, you know, probably if not your next car, your, your car after your next car will definitely be an EV. And so this whole narrative that the world is transitioning to a green electric world and the fundamental metal needed for that is copper. Um, it may not be the fundamental metal in the batteries themselves, which get a lot of attention. But when you think about the charging networks, the electrification of the globe, it's copper that's really doing the heavy lifting here. And so in anticipation of that, we've seen a lot of smelters in China, but also in Europe, um, start to initiate very large expansions so that they're ready for this you know, sudden increase in, in incremental global demand. Now you have to realize smelters are, are big, large beasts of a machine and they operate best and most efficiently when they're full. And so some of these smelters in China are now much bigger than they were a few years ago. And so they're just hungry for more and more mine concentrate to keep them full so that they run you know, most optimally and most economically. Uh, and so they're almost a little bit ahead of the curve. They're 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 looking to the future, um, but the future is 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 already causing them to to source a lot of copper. Yeah, yeah. Stefan, that's a good overview of what's happening in China with these treatment charges. Now let's look at South America, Central America. We have some issues here with supply, and why don't we just begin with the world's largest copper producer, and that's Chile. What's happening there? 
Yeah, well, I, I think Chile's taken a turn for the better, you know, over the last year or so. Um, there was a bit of a cloud or a bit of uncertainty surrounding Chile for for the better part of, call it, two years with um, a, a proposals of a new tax or royalty regime coming in. Um, I think at its at its most uncertain point, there was talks of, of seeing a, an effective tax rate, of, you know, up north of 70 percent. And obviously that's something that would greatly discourage foreign investment, you know, especially when you keep in mind that Chile is the world's number one copper producer. Um, it's just geologically very well endowed with with copper in the ground. Um, and so there was concerns um, from a foreign investment point of view that major miners would shy away from Chile just because it wasn't going to be economical under a new fiscal regime. Um, smarter heads have prevailed. That that new tax regime is now formally in place, and what we've seen is is, a, is a, an effective tax rate that has gone up. It is more expensive to do business in Chile now, um, but it, it's it's not prohibitive. It's actually on par with the likes of what we were already seeing in in other established first world nations like Canada and Australia, which are big miners themselves. So um, it wasn't the blowout or the the the, the, the basically the, the the storm that people were anticipating or, or fearing. And when you say Chile is the world's largest copper producer. What percent of global production would they produce? Uh, it's upwards of close to 30% right now. And to put that in perspective, the number two would be Peru. It's around 11, maybe 12%. Uh, and then you, you quickly start to fall off. Uh, the DRC now is, is number three at close to 9%. China's just behind that. And then you get into the likes of the US at 6%. And then from there, it, it falls off quite quickly into the sort of single digit percentage points right down to fractions of a percent. And what is happening in Peru? Uh, again, Peru, South America in general, I think you can, you can encapsulate that. Peru has, has proven to be, um, you know, it's a fable mining jurisdiction. Obviously, the fact that they produce, you know, close to 11, 12 percent of world copper speaks to that. Um, but, it, you know, it, 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 it is a place where there's, you know, still uh, political uncertainty to a certain extent. At the very least, it is a prolonged um, process to not only develop a mine, but even just explore for a mine in the first place. Um, there's over the last several years, there's been an, a lot of steps put in place by the government, which, you know, from an ESG responsible uh, point of view, they do make sense. Um, but they have extended the period or the amount of time required to take, um, you know, a, a project from call it grassroots discovery all the way through to eventual or potential mine development. So that's a good overview of what's happening with Chile and also Peru. Now I have to ask you about what's happening in Panama. They actually removed the mining license from First Quantum's Cobre Panama. Maybe you can give us a little bit of backstory there and how important this mine is to global production. Sure. So it's it's obviously one of the hot button hot button issues in 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 the in the mining space right now in terms of just a an, a reminder uh, that you know mining is global and so it is impacted by global politics. Uh, in the case of Cobra Panama, you know it's a very large scale mine recently put in production into production by First Quantum and then very shortly thereafter uh, effectively shut down by the government uh, for environmental concerns or reasons. And so that, you know, effectively took off, call it one and a half percent of global supply out of the market. And so, you know, that's one example of an issue where we do see uh, the, the supply side constrained as well due to political uncertainty or just political risk that's inherent, again, to a global industry like mining. And when do you expect this mine to come on and start producing again? Yeah, so it's it's still it's still up in the air for sure. Um, the, the key thing to realize right now that Panama is in an election year as we speak, and so I think first and foremost that has to run its course, which will happen through the spring and into the summer, uh, and then beyond that. The issue has now been taken to international arbitration, which I think by its very means entails a a long process uh, in terms of an exact timeline. It's to be determined for sure. So that's a good overview of what's happening on the supply side. Now let's look at the demand side. The UN's COP28 meeting, 118 countries backed a plan to triple renewable energy capacity by 2025. That's just next year. So this is coming up quick, but that's going to be very bullish for copper. And on the back of that, many U.S. brokers have taken their numbers up significantly on the copper price. Both Goldman Sachs and also Citibank have moved their long-term copper pricing to $15,000 a ton, which is about $6.80 a pound. Yeah. So that's a significant move. Maybe you can give us some overview. What are your thoughts on this and where do you see the long-term copper price going? 
Yeah. So, I mean, as soon as you hear renewable energy, obviously we're talking about things like, you know, wind and solar, and obviously again, the distribution to move that elect it's electricity. And so the distribution to, to move that electricity around is through copper wires. And so the implications for copper are, are huge. Um, you know, to put in perspective, the, 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 the pre sort of electrification of the world uh, sort of outlook for copper it was a 25 or is currently a 25 million ton a year market maybe 26 or 27 but that was kind of the scale of it and the incremental new demand from call it global electrification is estimated to be somewhere on on the order of 15 to 20 percent additional new copper is going to be required just to meet the growing demand and that's over a period of call it five to maybe 10 years uh, and so like what we're seeing with the with cop 28 and, and other initiatives, it, it's just really a recognition that we're going to need a lot more copper very soon. Um, 2025 is obviously coming up very quickly now. Um, I think we can all, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably fair to say that that's a timeline that's that's going to be fluid. Um, but the end game and the ultimate result of needing a lot more copper is still very much, I think, a thesis that remains intact. The timeline to get there, you know, may ebb and flow as we go uh, so stay tuned um, but again the final outcome and the ultimate magnitude of, of new copper demand i think is, is very real and that really drives i think everyone's agreement that you know the idea of 60 80 copper or higher over time is, is not crazy um, you know we're currently dealing with four dollar copper um, will it be 680 in 2025 again i think it really depends on how quickly we can really transition or practically transition the world towards that electrification narrative yeah, that's very aggressive pricing to go from four dollars a pound up to six eighty. Well, at least in the short term, right? Yeah. So let's move on now. I want to ask you about valuations, and I'm gonna I want to compare copper valuations to gold. In the mm -hmm. past, we saw gold equities trading at very high multiples, one point five to two times price to nav, but that's changed a lot here in the recent years, and now most gold producers are trading well below nav. Mm -hmm. And how does this compare to copper producers? Where are they trading on a price to nav basis? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to realize is gold companies have historically garnered a premium valuation to their base metal counterparts. Um, the simple argument being gold is gold and it's shiny and it's it's effectively money um, uh, for a whole bunch of other reasons. That said, like to your point, we are seeing the gold valuations trend down to somewhere that's closer to what we've seen historically for base metals. Um, when I think of base metals in particular, though, um, when I look to producers, for example, you know, companies that are have mines in production that are producing quarterly cash flow as we speak, um, it's typically a cash flow based valuation that I think most of the market looks to. And I'd say right now, sort of two metrics I, I, I focus on, it's, 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 you know, price to cash flow or EV to cash flow. And it, you know, it's, it's pick your poison depending on how much you want to sort of deal with the minutia of a specific company's balance sheet. Um, but to wrap some general numbers around it, I'd say historically, the base metal producers have traded around five times price to cash flow um, or seven times EV to cash flow. Um, that's just as a group average. Right now, they're both uh, either of those metrics, they tend to be trading about one point lower. So four times price to cash flow or six times EV to cash flow. So there's a little bit I think of room for them to move slightly higher post this recent bump up in copper to four dollars but it also tells me from a producer point of view the you know they have responded well to that sudden jump in copper and they're getting close to arguably being fully valued in the context i'd say of four dollar ish copper um, where it gets interesting though obviously the producers are always the first guys to move um, when you have a move in metal prices um, and so you know they're the lowest hanging fruit and so the next step is to look at the developers. And I think the developers still have a lot of room to catch up on in terms of you know, reflecting the recent move in copper price. And the way I look at developers, because they're not producing cash flow, you do revert to a NAV-based valuation. And I'd say right now in my space, um, the develop developers I'm looking at are trading on the order of 0.5 to 0.6 times fully financed uh, NAV. Um, and and more typically, they would trade around 0.8 to one times fully financed NAV. So there's still a bit of catch up to the, for them to have. And then if you want to go down even a, a, to a, a even a, a lower level, or not lower is the wrong word, but a, an even higher risk level, the explorers. Um, you know, right now we're seeing the copper explorer cos. You know, from an in situ valuation point of 
point of view, they're trading around three cents per pound in the ground of copper right now. And I'd say historically in a, in a decent market, it's closer to five to six cents a pound in the ground. So again, a lot of room for the explorers, just like the developers, I think to still trade higher uh, it, with the current sentiment versus the producers that uh, a little bit of wiggle room, but they're getting close to being reasonably valued. So from a historical point of view, the copper equities overall are still very cheap. I would say so. And again, uh, you know, keep in mind the numbers I'm looking at. I use 385 copper. Uh, we've been using that for well over a year now. Um, copper actually ended up averaging 385 exactly last year. So we, we somehow got that one right. Um, but obviously it's higher than that right now. And uh, when I look at NAVs in my space, my target prices, um, I'd say most of the producers, for example, that I'm covering right now are trading at or close to my target prices, which is great to see. They've come up recently in the last you know week or two on the on the copper price move. Um, what that also tells me though is the market in general is probably still thinking with sort of 385 copper glasses on, uh, maybe four dollars, but they're not really taking that next step to like we talked about earlier, 680 copper. That's that's a whole nother, you know, upside discussion to have. And and in time we will be having it. Um, I just think it's you know it's probably something that's a 2025 plus sort of conversation to have. And when you, you look at a company like, let's just say Freeport, okay, one of the largest copper producers in the world, what copper price do you think they would be using internally? You know, it's it's hard to say. I think uh, when it comes down to them making a, a you know, a, 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 an acquisition, for example, through m and I think they're probably using a fairly conservative number. You know, they want to stress test it, make sure it can handle a low copper price environment. Um, that said, when it comes to big projects that may be on the drawing board for them, they also do, the majors also do recognize the value in large projects and the generational opportunity they can provide. And, and you know, they have great experience and understanding that when you build a big mine, it will be that will hopefully be in production for decades. You know, it's going to have years where it does very well and years when it does not so well, given the cyclicity that we just know in mining. So they, they too tend to factor that into their equation. Um, but I, I would say, you know, I don't think they're throwing $5 copper at things to make fundamental investment decisions. Um, but they probably do run numbers to, to sort of think during the high cycles, what could this potentially do? Sure. Yeah. So when we summarize everything we discussed, we look at the supply side, it appears to be very tight. We have lower production in Chile, Peru. We have supply problems coming out of Panama. Then we have these treatment prices in China, which kind of leading to higher prices. And then when you look at the demand side, it's everything's being driven by this movement toward energy transition. And um, I'm not sure if you touched on this earlier, but even when you look at one an EV, uh, the uh, typical EV uses 150 pounds of copper versus a uh, traditional car only uses 50 pounds of copper. Mm -hmm. So on the demand side, it's growing significantly. And it sounds to me like the price is going to go one way and that's significantly higher. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And again, that's a medium to longer term view, which I think most people share. And we were, you know, we're experiencing it again in our in our daily lives, whether we bought a Tesla or electric car already, um, or we know someone that has, or we're just seeing them on the roads, and we kind of all know eventually we'll probably not have a choice. Um, in the short term, though, I think we just also, also from a dem demand point of view, have to be cognizant of sort of greater global economic factors. Obviously, you know, China, um, is the world's largest producer of refined copper. They're not the largest miner. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're kind of like probably fourth or fifth on the list. Um, but in terms of refined production, they are by far the biggest producer. They produce 55% of the world's refined copper uh, and consume all of that and then some. And, and so, you know, really a, a key thing that underpins the copper price as well as electrification of the world is just Chinese demand in general. And right now with, you know, uncertainty around Chinese housing and the ec ec economics over there, that's, I think, really also the one thing that's, you know, causing copper prices to maybe revert back into the $3 pound range, right, versus, you know, into the lower fours. Um, so that's, that's sort of where the tug of rope is right now over, I'd say, the next six to probably 12 months. Stefan, as we wrap up, what should investors be looking out for in the coming months to give them some idea of where the copper price might be going? Sure. I think I think it's a couple of things. Um, first, just global economic factors to consider, like we touched on is, you know, China and its hunger for copper in the in the sort of shorter term. Um, and then things like the housing market there are, are key indicators of that. Um also, don't forget about the U.S. and the idea of, you know, U.S. Uh, rate hikes or sorry, rate cuts, um, which, you know, have been deferred, but 
the anticipation is that we will be seeing them in the summertime. So that will also impact copper pricing to the downside. So keep those in mind. Um, but then on the flip side of that, obviously we're seeing a lot of uncertainty um, at the smelting level, like we, we, we talked about, about in the beginning of this. Um, you know, when we talk about the smelters also realize, you know, we, uh, China has gone through this big expansionary phase where these Chinese smelters want more and more copper. Um, the other shoe to drop from that narrative is in Europe, the si similar things happened. And there's anticipation that as we move into the second half of this year and into 2025, we're also going to see European smelters also start to be, you know, have finished expansions and be looking for more and more mine supply as well. So that's another dynamic that factors in. Uh, and then finally, you know, the wild card again, mining is, is, is global. It can be political. Um, and so, you know, unforeseen shutdowns, whether they're through labor disputes, political unrest, environmental concerns like Cobra Panama, um, these can pop up overnight and have drastic effects on perceived copper supply. So, yeah. Okay, so before I let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Where is the copper price going by the end of the year? <laughs> I, again, I think I think it's it's probably uh, you know it's really going to depend on some of those factors I just mentioned. Um, you know, we we started the year off at 385. We're up just over four now. Um, I think a key thing to watch in the very short term is we've we've heard this agreement in theory between various Chinese smelters to control their purchasing to to basically try and get treatment charges up, but we haven't seen it qualified yet. So we don't know exactly what cuts are looking like. So I think that's the first shoe to drop. Um, and then as we move through the year, again, Chinese housing market, US rate cuts, um, you know, follow that all through the year. It's obviously now turned into a giant black box. Um, but if I had to guess, I think I, 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 I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll see something with a four in front of it. Um, so we'll have to wait and see, yeah. That's not nearly bullish enough. I'm going to have to get one of your counterparts. <laughs> well, listen, Stefan, that was a great overview of what's happening in the copper markets. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. Many people might remember you from GT Gold, which was acquired by Newmont in 2021. And now you're the CEO of Faraday Copper. Can you give us the backstory on Faraday and how you got involved? Yeah. Hi, Jimmy. Good to be here today. And certainly, you know, after GT Gold, I teamed up with Russell Ball, who was former CFO at both Newmont and, uh, and Gold Corp. And we were looking at opportunities. We got introduced, actually, the, the Faraday used to be called Copper Bank, and it had been set up like a bank to store copper assets when when the uh, copper price was low. So we got introduced to the founder, uh, really liked what we saw in terms of particularly the, the Arizona project, uh, went and did a due diligence over several months. Uh, and then we put a proposal together to the then board and took over the running of the company in September 2021. And as you mentioned, the asset is based in the state of Arizona, and we've seen so many examples of where jurisdiction has been an issue with mining companies. The most recent case was First Quantum in, in Panama. Can you just touch on the mining industry in Arizona and let us know how robust it is? Yeah, I mean, Arizona has been built on the back of mining. It produces 70% of, of the U.S.'s copper um, it's a mining friendly jurisdiction. You know, there's a lot happening going on there. You've got all the major players in the world operating, you know, whether it's Freeport, BHP, Rio Tinto. I mean, more recently, we've seen Tosico get their permits to develop the Florence project. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the South the, or the Board of South 32 sanctioned the go ahead of the Hermosa project in, in southern Arizona. And then we also see Arizona Sonora delivered a PFS uh, on the Cactus project and uh, Ivanhoe Electric are busy with the Santa Cruz project also in Arizona. So very active area, uh, a lot happening in the state. And maybe you can just touch on the infrastructure and also the water issue. Yeah, look, Arizona's got a great infrastructure. I mean, for us, our project is right next to the highway. There's an active rail system. There's um, power lines. There's actually a, a big new federally funded uh, renewable energy project coming right through the valley where our project is. It's bringing um, solar and wind generated power from New Mexico up into Arizona and onto California. So, you know, ex excellent infrastructure, you know, also uh, skilled workforce. Um, 
and and look when when you talk about water you know it's i think it's you know i guess mining as a whole is is challenging around the world you mentioned other jurisdictions where there's been problems for first quantum and i think as we go through this energy transition then you know you're starting to put people out of their comfort zone their immediate response is 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 no so permitting you know has been a challenge i think globally but people are starting to recognize the connection between mining and and um and the clean energy transition, but it's all about social license. And, um, you know, we're looking at going with a dry stack tailings facility, recognizing that Arizona, you know, being able to recycle as much water as possible is key. I think more traditional style tailings are going to be more challenging to permit. So, you know, from the offset, going with dry stack tailings and being able to, you know, minimize water is critical going forward. And Paul, you made a very good point about the importance of social licensing. Maybe you can just touch on what Faraday Copper is doing to maintain that relationship with the local communities. Yeah, I mean, when you're doing exploration, you know, you're some of the first people on the ground in in project areas, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. And so building building those relationships early early on, you know, engaging with the community. Um, starting those uh, dialogue, you know, we've had open house houses with the local communities, and unfortunately, the two local communities right adjacent to the project, uh, San Manuel and Mammoth, are, are former mining communities that were built by Magna Copper in the 1950s for the old San Manuel mine. But um, you know, it's important to to sort of, you know, hold people's hands through so that they understand, you know what exploration and then ultimately the development of the project into a mine is. So that starts from the first day on the ground, really. So let's move on now and talk about Faraday copper and the actual resource. And maybe you can just give us the specifics, how many pounds the average copper grade is. Yeah, so so the Copper Creek project, which is our flagship uh, project in Arizona, has got 4.2 billion pounds in the measured and indicated category. It's one of the largest undeveloped resources in the United States that's still in the hands of a junior. And we've got a grade around about half a percent copper. Um, both into, We've got both open pit and underground resources. Um, and the, 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 the high, we've got 83% of our resources in the meta, measured and indicated category. And, um, you know, it, it's a function of the amount of drilling that's been done on the project historically, over 200,000 metres of drilling. And that's really having all of that technical data was what de-risked the project in, in our eyes and, and um, motivated us to want to be involved in it. And you've also implemented a resource optimization plan. And part of that plan was the phase two drilling program. Can you just touch on the results from that program? Yeah, I'd like to take, take a step back first. You know, I think when we came into the project in September 21, we, you know, in just over two years, we put together all the technical data, a geological model to support a resource update. And then on the back of the resource, we were then able to, to put out a PEA, which two things it did. It demonstrated economically or the potential for an economically viable project. And then importantly, it highlighted the levers that we needed to pull in terms of unlocking further value. And so one of those was um, our phase two drilling, which was post the mineral resource and the PEA. And what that showed was that we had a number of our, our potential open pits that were limited on data and they hadn't been drilled at depth. And so we had a program of that phase two drilling that highlighted you know, extensions to the mineralization below the open pit, as well as lateral extensions. But it also showed that we were getting an increase in precious metals, particularly gold. And previously, gold had not been estimated by previous work that hadn't been assayed. So we've had a big program of assaying for gold to bring that into future resource estimates and also study work. And, and so from that phase two, that's really laid the platform to, to our further programs that we're currently executing on right now. And so let's talk about that. You're moving ahead with a phase three drilling program. How many meters do you have planned and where will the targets be? Yep, we're underway with our phase three program. We've uh, currently drilled 6,000 meters altogether. We've got between 15 and 20,000 meters of drilling. And that's... Um, focused on three elements, really. There's, one is the, the open pit expansion, so that the um, those open pits remain open to extensions. 
We also see the underground as well, that there's opportunity to, to not only enhance the grade of the underground, but expand it. And then thirdly, about making new discoveries in a really underexplored area. So if you look at all the historical drilling, 95% of it has been done in the resource, but in the district, there's been very little drilling and we see the opportunity to make more discoveries. And I guess that's one of the benefits about working in Arizona, you can drill all year round. No, you certainly can. I mean, um, you know, great weather. You also don't have altitude issues either. So you touched on you want to do some exploratory drilling and you have you and your team have targeted 33 priority targets of those targets. Which ones are you going to focus on? And what's been really exciting is, you know, we started the campaign off with a new discovery in what we call Area 51. That's 800 meters away from the current resource. And we identified um, a new breccia. And, and maybe what I should say is there's two styles of mineralization on this project. One of these high grade breccias that come to surface, they have more than a percent copper in the in the core of them. And then they have an outer halo of lower grade mineralization. And then we've got the the porphyry style mineralization, which is a series of quartz stock works. Um, and that's really what relates to the underground uh, resource. So we've been focused on near surface uh, breaches and Area 51. We've now made two new breacher discoveries, Starship and Eclipse. Uh, we're seeing it's an, its own porphyry center and there's altogether nine breaches around there. So we're now busy testing additional breaches in that immediate resource, uh, oh, sorry, in that immediate Area 51. But also we've got these two big structures across the district that, that is the main fluid conduit for the breaches and the porphyries. And as I say, Area 51 is the first of 33 target areas. And so, you know, we're busy systematically working along those structures, you know, further testing, you know, additional targets. And so, you know, really exciting to, to be able to make that first um, discovery and really supports the thesis that there's a lot more to find. And Paul, you touched on this earlier, but another element of the optimization plan is network to improve the copper recoveries. Can you just expand on this and what it entails? Yeah, we took the phase two drilling. We took samples from that and, and um, ran a, a comprehensive metallurgical program, which we put the results out the, about three weeks ago now. And what that showed was we were getting improved recoveries on the sulfide as well as on, on, the, on the oxide. Uh, a very clean concentrate, you know, more than 30% copper in that concentrate, um, no deleterious elements that will be penalty grade in, in, in a concentrate. And then also we added gold into the flow sheet. But, but also what we saw was that uh, from the work in the PEA to now, we saw the opportunity to bring in a coarse grind. And so we've taken that material and we're seeing an average of between 350 and 370 microns. So being able to, to add in coarse grind into the flow sheet obviously allows throughput increase and it also reduces OPEX costs as well. So that really starts to drive further value. So you've got the two components of, of the metallurgical work, uh, adding that in with the, with the exploration and adding new discoveries really starts to, to push um, value increase and, and throughput. And the hope is that the gold will become an additional byproduct. No, exactly. And we're seeing we're getting um, between 75 and 80 percent recovery reporting to the copper concentrate. So certainly uh, payable. Paul, I want to move on now and discuss your shareholder base and also your balance sheet. And Faraday Copper has some very impressive shareholders. And I guess the one I want to ask first about is Lundin. Yeah, no, look, great supporters, great to have those strategic holders, whether it's the Lundins, Murray Edwards or Pierre Lassand. When we joined the company, uh, the Lundin family had a small holding of about 3%. And, and then as we took them through our business plan, what our strategy was, the opportunity here, then they participated in um, financings that we've done over the last couple of years and increased that holding to, to just over 19%. And, you know, they're, they're strong supporters. Uh, and, um, you know, great to have them on board. I think it, you know, it, it reinforces the quality of this project. And how active are they? Do they help out a, lo a lot on the technical side? No, I think they've got confidence in, in the team and uh, they're generally a silent shareholder. And do they have any operations currently in Arizona? 
No, they don't. They um, they do support the University of Arizona, and it's called the Lundin School of Mining. And let's talk about your cash position. How much cash do you have on hand, and how will you allocate that cash in the coming year? Yeah, we're in a fortunate position that we're well funded. We have just over $12 million as of today's date. Um, that's sufficient to see us through towards the end of the year uh, and deliver on our key milestones, which is one, you know, the, the main one being the fifteen to 20,000 metres of drilling and obviously uh, the metallurgical work as well. But obviously at some point uh, this year, I estimate that we'd need to finance again. Paul, one of the unique features of the management team at Faraday is that you've all worked at large mining companies, and I want you to expand on how these this skill set will benefit a copper exploration company like Faraday. Yeah, great question, Jimmy. And and I think the key is, you know, we've all been involved in not only making the discoveries, taking them through the studies, and and building them out into mines. So we know what it takes for it to become a mine, and there's no shortcuts here. And so what it is, it's about bringing the rigor and discipline, particularly around the technical work and making sure we've got that empirical data to make those informed decisions. As I say there's there's no shortcuts here. And we see in the market, you know, a lot of penalization companies in penalty boxes because, you know, either they got the study work, the costs wrong. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of scrutiny right now around about capital costs, operating costs, you know, company not making their their budgets. And and that has a negative impact, not just to us, but, you know, across the industry. So, you know, making sure we have the rigor and discipline. And and secondly, as well, you know, we continue to see technical failures in our, in our industry, which doesn't help us. And so, again, you know, making sure we've got those fundamental building blocks, starting off with the geology, we've got all the geotechnical work done, all the metallurgical work that feeds into, into you know, ultimately coming up with a robust study that will enable the execution of, of a project into a mine. And, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, the average investor doesn't understand what the rigor and discipline that is needed. And you just made mention of the fact that you want to move ahead and, move, and turn this into a mine. And, but what are your final plans? Do you actually want to build a mine yourself or are you hoping to de-risk this project and then sell it to a major? Look, it's always a challenge for a junior mining company with a sort of hundred million dollar market cap to to consider a large capital project. At this stage, uh, our strategy is to de-risk the project technically, add a further value through the drill bit, making new discoveries, and then look at some point packaging this up and exiting it onto you know somebody who will develop this into a mine. And and I think you know when you look at the U.S. and and their drive to want to be um, you know you know, produced in the US, then, you know, we're going to have a, a really valuable project that will form part of that clean energy transition as we move forward. Yes. And, and to that point, everybody is looking for copper to take advantage of this move into energy transition. Not only the large uh, mining companies, but also the gold companies are also looking for copper projects and they can't find any. No, that's it. That, that alchemy, right? <laughs> That, um, you know, every, everyone's scrambling. I mean, I think, in, you know, you take a step back and say, you know, that the Chinese are leading the way. They've gone around the world and, and gobbled up resources. They've got smelter capacity underway. They're building out that infrastructure. You know, you feel that uh, if the West's not careful, they're, they're a little asleep at the wheel. Yeah. But, but obviously, you know, that does bring opportunity. And, um, you know, as we continue to advance um our project and, and then see um, this clean energy or the momentum starting to, to move forward a lot more rapidly, then we're going to have that project ready to develop, which is exciting. So there's a lot of benefits going for Faraday. It's in the right jurisdiction. It has a large asset with a good grade. And maybe you can just summarize again what you and your team are going to do to unlock value on this project. Yeah, no, it's a, an exciting year ahead in 2024. We've got the 15 to 20,000 meters of drilling ongoing. You can expect to see more drill results coming over the over the next weeks and months. Um, we've also got additional metallurgical work. And then the idea is that we'll wrap the phase two drilling together with the drilling that we're doing now into a new mineral resource update and then look to update the technical study as we go into 2025.
Well, that's great. I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and providing this overview of Faraday Copper. And I look forward to an update in the coming months. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Great speech to you today. Hi, Airfan. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Vancouver? Oh, wonderful. Thanks for asking, Jimmy. Things are going really well. So Horizon Copper recently provided a number of asset updates within its portfolio. And the first one I want to discuss with you is Antonina. It's the third largest copper mine in the world, and it's located in Peru. And it's also a cash flowing asset. But what exactly was the news that came out on Antonina? Yeah, pretty significant news coming out of Antamina in the last uh, while. Um, one of the things that we've been telling people about is how we think this is going to be, you know, an asset that's going to be cash flowing for many, many years to come, decades in fact. And more recently, they put out some information saying that their modified EIA just got approved, which means essentially that they now have plans to go into uh, 2036 in terms of mining as part of their their base case and you know that's pretty significant you know knowing that you know you get the permits to do more mining on their or their open pit and it isn't somewhat constrained by in terms of resources this is an asset that we think will be cash flowing for many years beyond that and uh, it's one of a habit as a cornerstone asset in our portfolio that's kind of the high level headline news but I think what some people didn't appreciate um, until you started looking into the, uh, the MEIA was the fact that they also contemplated moving um, an expansion on the throughput. So going from 150,000 tons per day to over 200,000 tons per day. And that's pretty significant where, you know, you can increase that, that throughput by, you know, close to 30 to 40 percent. And that means and once if that gets in place and once it's um, um, uh, operating effectively, that's tremendous amount of additional cash flow coming in earlier to Horizon shareholders, which is great news. So we're really happy to, to see that. So you raise a very good point about the size of this, this uh, mine. And I just want to reinforce this for our viewers. The mineral reserves at Antamina is 226 million tons at 0.94% copper. M&I is 673 million tons. So it's just a massive asset. Yeah, and that m and is ex uh, exclusive of reserves. So it is one of these assets that we think is in cash flow for a super long time. And, and that's the nice thing about associating yourself with world quality assets, like Antamina is the third largest copper mine in the world on a copper equivalent basis. And when you associate yourself with these quality assets, you find ways that the assets continue to grow, cash flow kits and reinvest into it. There's more exploration results. Um, and these are things that when it costs so little to actually mine, the cash flow delta on it on the margins are quite considerable. So you reinvest back into that asset. And the nice thing about having our MPI royalty is we don't actually have to have a cash outlay. We, don't, we just get a check on a quarterly basis, which is nice. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because with the expansion of the open pit and also the tailings facilities, what's the capex on this? Yeah. Um, so Tech, one of the operators of that mine, it's owned by like Glencorp, BHP, Mitsubishi and Tech. And so Tech put out some news indicating that they expect over the next eight years, there's about eight, uh, about $2 billion that will be spent. So it'll be spent over a course of a decade. But the nice thing about how we have it structured, we don't actually have to go write a check. Unlike, uh, you know, if you're uh, a, a partner as part of, you know, owning an asset, um, you actually have to go write your portion of that capex. We don't have to go write that check. You know, that, that, gets paid over the course of, you know, the life of the mine as an MPI. And so we just sit back and, you know, cheer them on and, and put out the replication of the good news that tech does and and uh, and collect the, the cash as copper prices go up as well. And just to reinforce this point, the operators are going to spend $2 billion over eight years and Horizon Copper does not put up one cent. That's right. We don't write a check for any of that. Uh, we just get uh, quarterly cash payments. Now, an MPI works is this portion of your operating expenses, expenses um, based on, you know, what is your revenue, what are your operating expenses, and you, we get that net amount. 
But the great thing about having an asset that's very low cost, one of the low cost um, uh, copper mines in the world is you get tremendous margin. So if you believe in the copper price, you believe that it'll be higher uh, in the long run than it is today, you just get that incremental margin over time, over the next decade, which is, which is wonderful. And what we believe will be multi-decades. Yeah, and so the copper price is currently trading around $8,800 a ton, and I've seen research reports out of Goldman Sachs, Citi, and also JP Morgan. They think it's going to go significantly higher by 2025. I think I've seen reports as high as $15,000 a ton, so that's a massive move. Yeah, that would be incredible, and and you know you can see why some of these very reputable banks are indicating uh, why they believe the copper price will be higher i don't think it's any surprise but um to people who are in the mining industry who follow closely in the sense that it is really hard to actually build mines you know the supply deficit that's coming and even assets that have been you know talked about for the last decade still haven't been built. It just takes a tremendous amount of effort getting your permits in place and moving projects forward. So we're really excited that we have Antamina in our portfolio. The other thing to keep in mind that I think sometimes gets lost in the equation when people look at you know copper price and the assets that you have, you want an asset that lasts for many, many years because the copper price, you know, if you've got an asset that lasts for five to 10 years, you know, you might miss the window when copper goes on a tear or the cash flows associated with that uh, those years may not be as significant. When you've got an asset that goes for many decades, that's when you get the real value popping up in terms of uh, copper price appreciation. So, and maybe you could just touch on the, like this mine is cash flowing now, but how much does Horizon Copper receive from Antamina? Yeah, so we get a check on a quarterly basis um, based on the production at the underlying mine. And so based on prices about 380 copper, if you if you um, look at pounds instead of metric tons like um, 8,800, uh, you're looking about 10 to $15 million US on an annual basis that Horizon gets on average. That's net of any of the streams or royalties how we've, uh, you know, um, acquired the asset. That's actual cash flow tributal to Horizon shareholders. So copper prices go higher, your incremental cash flow goes higher significantly as well. And that doesn't take into account the throughput expansion that I talked about earlier. And Horizon Copper has another indirect interest in another world-class copper mine, and that's Rio Tinto's OT mine, which is located in the country of Mongolia. Maybe you can just touch on the indirect interest in this mine through your ownership of Entree Resources. Yeah, so we own 25% uh, of Entree Resources. They trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. If you just look at our look-through value of what it's, uh, our 25% is worth, just on marketable securities, it's about 60 million US, which is greater than our market cap today. Um, uh, that entity, Entree, has a finance carried interest on a portion of the OU Togoi ground. Um, and so we own 25% of that company. The other major shareholder is Rio Tinto. So we're the two major shareholders of that entity itself. And we're really excited about it um, because this is an asset that in the last year, you know, there's been news coming out of it where before it hasn't won. They've done the draw bells. They're, you know, moving forward the underground mining. Historically, it's been an open pit operation. Now it's moved to underground mining. And that's where, you know, the, the, the work and efforts required to put in the CapEx and move it forward. And that's been spent getting a lot of the, that, that work done. And now it's more of a function of time uh, before they move on to the, uh, uh, the Hugo North extension, which is essentially the portion that we have our finance carried interest in. So, you know, a couple of years time is when they start, you know, mining on that ground from what we understand. And so we're really excited to have another one of these world-class assets in our portfolio. And so why don't we, you just made mention of the fact that you're hoping to receive, uh, I guess, cash flow from this asset in a couple of years, but maybe just back up a little bit. When will the development work start on this asset? Yeah, so a lot of that work has been going on. Um, so there's, and I'll get into a little bit of technical in terms of nomenclature, but there's something called lift one, panel one, that includes the Hugo North extension, that mine design has been completed. Um, so that work has been done, that improves stability and 
construction and operability of that asset. But then the, the first Yugo North uh, extension development work is expected to happen uh, later this year, so the second half of 2024. And um, what they're doing is they're establishing, you know, panel one, Western or kind of like the handling and the, the truck shoot. And then the next kind of component in the second half of this year is also the commissioning of shaft three and four. So those are kind of like immediate things that'll be happening on the development side uh, in 2024. And then also when you add on the fact that we're expecting an updated Hugo North resource model for both lists one and two, um, I think that's another good kind of uh, re-rating event that we, we hope to for Rio and then Entree to, to publicly announce when available. And production will start in 2027. We anticipate production, so mining on the, the that portion of the Entree ground in 2027. Herfan, the last asset I want to inquire about is Hot Medan, which is a copper gold project in Turkey. SSR Mining is also the operator of this asset. And recently, SSR Mining had a very unfortunate accident in uh, Turkey, maybe you can just touch on that and also what the ramifications are for Hot Medan and what this means going forward. Yeah, thanks for that question, Jimmy. Um, as you said, a very unfortunate incident, not related to Horizon or Hot Medan um, in terms of, you know, the asset itself. They had an incident at one of their mines. Um, it was a completely different mine, um, heat bleach operation with cyanide. Two key components that aren't anyway um, uh, transferable to Hamadan. There's no cyanide Hamadan, there's no um, heat bleach operation. So it's a very simple operation while the other operation was quite complicated. Um, at the end of the day, I think what it does is it um, potentially delays the, the commercial production of the Hamadan project. And the reason is SSR Mining is gonna be focusing over the next couple of months on that, that other project, um, making sure they get through their operations and move forward on it. So it'll uh, take their timeline away from it uh, in terms of their resources and, and their focus. Um, and so I think that, yeah, people should expect a delay in commercial production by, you know, some people think six months, I think, you know, up, up to a year is a good estimation to take in terms of, you know, how long um, that delay will impact um, our project itself. But the other things to keep in mind, this is a project that we believe will definitely get built for the simple fact that it's just world class. It's incredibly high grade. You know, some of the grades for gold are, you know, 8.8 .8 grams. That's like the average head grade. And copper is incredibly high as well. So it's an outlier in terms of gold and copper. And it's in a country that's the largest gold producer in all of Europe with, you know, expectations and aims to be in one of the, the top uh, producing uh, gold countries out there. So there's support behind it. It's a very high quality asset. And even before SSR got involved with the asset, you know, it received its key permits, the EIA and its forestry permit. So, you know, we're pretty confident that this is an asset that is going to move forward and it's going to be cash flowing for many, many years to come. Good update. And you also made mention of the fact that Antamina is a cash flowing asset. Your other two assets are at the development stage. But because you do have cash flow coming in, how will you allocate that in the coming year? And would you ever consider acquiring another cash flowing asset? Yeah, it's it's in a wonderful position to not have to go raise any equity where you're cash flowing, you know, you have your capital available for your projects or you have finance carried interest. So we're in an enviable position. There's a lot of copper companies out there who are just waiting to tap the equity markets a little bit when it opens up so that they can um, you know, raise some additional capital and put in their project. And so we do see in our pipeline opportunities available where you can you know, acquire a, a minority position or passive interest in an operation that's cash flowing today. But because you know, I've, I've elected over the last uh, year and a half or so to just take you know, dollar a year salary, all my returns associated with Horizon Copper are purely equity returns. So when we're looking at transactions to do, for me, it's a really easy test. Will this help increase the share price or not increase the share price? 
while you know some other people then calculus might be like do i get bigger so that my salary gets bigger because i've got more operations so those are the ways we're looking at it but when you look at our assets today you got you know a world-class asset that's cash flowing today you've got you know hot madan which is fully permitted which um we believe will get you know moving forward uh, once ssr you know uh, um, uh, deal with some of their, their other issues or it gets another hand or, or what have you and it's world class so we know that's moving forward and our third asset in entree you know that's already in production it just isn't producing on the entree ground and so you already have this massive amount of growth built into your portfolio already that you don't have to necessarily go buy another cash flowing asset but we're very inquisitive um, and we're doing due diligence and we'll see if uh, any of them materialize. Um, I don't think a deal is done until you sign or anything, but we're looking to add more quality assets in the portfolio like you've seen us do over the last 18 months. And maybe you can speak to the pipeline because I'm, I'm very curious when it comes to copper assets. I keep reading that everybody's looking for copper, including not only BHP and Rio Tinto, but the gold producers like Newmont and Barrick. Yeah, copper, when I started, wasn't a precious metal. Now it's becoming more and more precious in, in some people's minds and trading at a higher multiple. Um, I think that there's a lot of competition to get copper assets. There have been uh, over the last couple of years. And what you see that competition happening at more taking ownership or operating positions in these copper assets. So actually like owning 51% of it at a minimum. We're not looking to do that. The beauty of our business model, and it's relatively new, is we're looking for more minority positions. And the benefit of having those minority positions is you can build out a larger portfolio. You know, you're not putting all your eggs in one asset. You're not, um, you know, just limited to one jurisdiction. You know, you can have the diversified portfolio, and it doesn't require much more effort. It doesn't require much effort for me to, you know, collect the check from tech on a quarterly basis. And so you can add to that portfolio. And so um, I quite like it. And that means the pipeline that we're looking at, there aren't many people who are looking at minority positions. In fact, you know, there aren't many companies that you mentioned that would be interested in buying a minority position. They're looking to operate. We're not looking to operate. We're looking to actually just build that portfolio and get exposure to even better assets and more and high quality assets than you would in necessarily a junior copper company so let's talk about valuation um it, it's very unique for the reasons that you just mentioned and you mentioned earlier that because of your interest in entree resources you own 25 percent of that which equates into a value of 60 million dollars is that correct that's right yeah so and this is more than your your current market cap of horizon copper so it's trading at a huge discount yeah, we think we're an incredible buy. I think um, I think when you just look at it from a, just a, a, a normal perspective, how do you value it? Do you look at what are the value of the assets? Well, you can look at Antimina, third largest copper in the modern world. You can look at um, you know Hot Modern, the quality of that asset, and what SSR paid for its interest, and you can value it that basis. If you follow that path on a NAV basis, we're trading at you know less than half our NAV by a lot. And so you can see, you know, the tremendous um, uh, value proposition there. You can also look at it from perspective of cash flow. How much are you going to cash flow on a yearly basis? And there's some slides out there on our website that talks about, you know, just based on spot copper prices today, how much you cash flow with these assets. And, you know, you'd be cash flowing essentially your market cap just based on spot prices alone. And that's pretty compelling. And that's just the nature of how we build the company. It's a uh, you know, quarter of a billion dollar enterprise value US, but the market cap is a small component of that. The differential is just based on some 10 year debentures with very low interest rates, no financial covenants. You get a tremendous amount of torque and you get these outsized returns as a result of them as your assets um, produce and perform. And so I think it's quite compelling whether or not you look at it from a cash flow perspective or a NAV basis. And as we continue to get the Horizon story name out there, as some of these catalysts that we hope will come out over the next six months start getting into the, the new cycle, I think you're gonna see some of that appreciation come. 
Irfan, as we wrap up, maybe you can just summarize for investors why they should consider Horizon as an investment and what catalysts they can look forward to from Horizon Copper in the coming months. Yeah, I, I think one, you're not going to find a copper story out there below a billion market cap that has three world-class assets in its portfolio that's actually cash flowing today that doesn't need to go raise equity to move its assets forward. I think that's quite enviable. Um, the other thing that I think is quite unique is the leverage point that I mentioned before of the fact that you get so much torque to the copper story based on how we structured the, the company. You've got a management team that's incentivized because they put so much of their you know, resources into the stock as well. Um, and you know, over the last six months, I've been purchasing shares, insiders have been purchasing shares because we think it's a great way um, to ride the copper wave. In terms of catalysts over the next few months, I think one of the things we're focusing on is increasing liquidity. And so we're looking at getting an OTCQX um, uh, filing out there so that, you know, people in the States can start uh, participating in the story. Uh, you're going to see us uh, hopefully put out some more news on credit uh, facilities available to us with, you know, chartered Canadian banks just to provide extra firepower so people know, hey, these guys don't have to go raise equity to um, you know, acquire assets or, or move projects forward. I think that'll be a good news event. I think you know, you're gonna get more news on the things that I mentioned with respect to Entree as they start publicizing some of those uh, operational developments uh, on that asset. And I think you're gonna get great news stories coming out of like Antimina that we just got over the last you know, month or two on just the expansion of the operations, what they're looking to do. And then finally, um, while Hot Modern isn't even in our market cap at all, um, what uh, I think shareholders will benefit what, from is cl greater clarity coming out of the operator and the timelines associated with that project. So I think the next six months should be um, quite exciting for, for Verizon shareholders. Well, that was a great update and a great overview. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. And I look forward to our next update. Great. Thanks, Jimmy. Did you know we're now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts? So now you can listen to us on Spotify or Apple and listen and learn when you're stuck in traffic on the 401 in Toronto, the I-95 in New York, or the I-5 in LA. So be sure to subscribe and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. You and your team have been very innovative in creating new products to capitalize on the whole energy transition theme. And you recently created a new copper ETF, which will augment your two other copper products. Can you just provide an overview of this new product and how it is different from the other copper products? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me back, Jimmy. Always good to uh, engage with you and your audience. Uh, a few weeks ago, we we launched the Sprott Copper Miners ETF um, in the U.S. And uh, a little over a year ago, we uh, launched a Junior Copper Miners ETF, also in the United States. And and those funds were really being launched based on our belief that copper is going to go through a secular bull market. And the reason why we have this very constructive thesis about copper is that we think it it actually has some interesting parallels with uranium. And as you and I've talked about uh, many times in the past, uranium is, is in a bull market right now. And copper, we think, is just starting to enter one. And it's really being driven by, I think, growing understanding and, and realization that copper is going to really be the backbone of the move to decarbonization and electrification and all the related technologies um, that we're going to need to deploy at, at much greater levels in the coming years to achieve, you know, decarbonization goals. So copper is a, a metal that I think most people think of as, as uh, you know, fairly simple, and but it really does play an important role because it is so important in terms of uh, moving electrons around. Yes, and you raise a very interesting point when you compare copper to uranium in terms of the supply demand characteristics. And why don't we just start with the demand side, because what's really driving this is this big push by countries globally to, to move toward a, a carbon free environment. And why don't we just touch on electric vehicles and also solar panels and, and the need for wind turbines? 
Yeah, so I think most people think of copper as, you know, perhaps a, a industrial metal, uh, which its its role has largely been over the last few centuries. Uh, and it's it's one of the reasons why copper has the nickname Dr. Copper, because it was a way to gauge the health of the global economy, just because it has historically played such an important role in industrial applications and construction and things like that. But what we've seen happen over the last few years is a transition uh, in terms of copper's role to, to technologies and industries that are focused on energy transition. Energy transition is just another way of saying moving away from fossil fuel-based industries to industries that are focused on producing cleaner forms of energy in terms of carbon footprint, the transmission of electricity, and then the storage of electricity, which is largely coming in the form of electric vehicle batteries, as well as, I think, uh, ever increasing amount of uh, large scale batteries, uh, large scale battery storage for renewable energy. And when you look at these use cases for copper, um, let's just start with electric vehicles, because that is projected to be a big part of the growing demand for copper. If you think about a typical uh, gasoline powered car, um, it requires about 50 pounds of copper. If you compare that against a typical electric vehicle, it's about 120 pounds. So you have about a 2.4 times as much copper intensity as an electric vehicle than you do with a gasoline powered car. And as the world gradually moves to electric vehicles, this is expected to consume a lot more copper. But it's not just it's not just the way we're going to be driving around. It's obviously things like solar farms and wind farms, both on and offshore. There are they are much more co uh, copper intensive. If you think about solar, it's about two and a half times uh, as intense versus, let's say, a fossil fuel uh, powered uh, electricity station. And onshore wind is about two and a half times as as copper intense, and offshore wind is about seven times. And so, what we're seeing is record deployments of solar, uh, predominantly being being deployed in the world as as countries try to decarbonize. Uh, China is obviously leading the world in terms of the deployment. China's added more solar capacity last year than the world combined has done in the last four years. And that is very copper intensive in terms of, of moving electricity around. The other part that is anticipated to require significantly more copper is through transmission. So just think about you know moving electrons around, whether it's from a power station or through different appliances, or think about data centers uh, related to cloud services, think about AI, the data centers for those, very copper intensive. So I think the world has finally realized that that plain old copper, which we've been mining um, for 5,000 plus years, is going to be a very important metal for the energy transition in the coming decades. Yeah, saying you made an interesting point about EVs and how much is required for these. And and I'm sure a lot of people saw the headlines recently from Tesla. Their production numbers for Q1 or Q4 were down significantly. But one thing we can't forget is uh, EV growth is really exploding in China and other places throughout the world. In the year 2023, million EVs were sold globally. And in 2023, it was 15 million. And I'm not too sure what the numbers are forecasted for 2024, but this is a trend that is not going away. Yeah, it's interesting. China just announced that 50% of new car sales are in the category now called new energy vehicles, uh, which encompass fully electric cars, uh, hybrid electric cars, as well as plug-in hybrid car cars. So 50% of all new car sales are in China have some kind of a battery in them, which is really interesting. Obviously, other parts of the world are lagging behind in terms of the penetration rates. But I think the trend is inevitably up as more choice uh, is, is brought to consumers. Prices of electric cars come down uh, and approach parity to gasoline. It's, it's inevitable that we see greater uh, electric vehicle adoption globally. And this year, I think the number we've seen is somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 and a half million odd electric cars to be sold compared to about 14 million last year. So Yes, the growth is moderating from, you know, very high levels where we were seeing 30 and 40 percent growth. But I think the growth is still going to be very robust um, and it's it's not going to be one or two years. I think the, the cycle here is still in the early stages. 
So that's a good overview of what's happening on the demand side. Let's look at the supply side. And I want to begin with Chile. It's the world's largest producer of copper, produces about 25% of global production. Maybe you can just touch on that and what's happening there in country. Yeah, so everybody focuses on on, on Chile because, as you mentioned, it's the it's the world's largest um, producer of copper. Um, there is a state-owned company. Um, the acronym for its name is called Cadelco. And they just put out their 2023 production numbers, and they were down 8% last year. Um, so even though we've seen very durable demand for copper, uh, they, you know, they're obviously having production problems. Now, what is driving that? Well, some of the mines are, you know, they're getting kind of long in the tooth in terms of coming to end of life. Um, they've been mining copper there for, for a very long time. And so the easy stuff's found there, you know, you have to go deeper and deeper. And I think one of the big challenges there is the ore grades have come down significantly over the years. So, which means you, you've got to move a lot more earth to get the same amount of ore. And then with Chile specifically, they are having some challenges in terms of water scarcity, which is, which is important. So what's interesting to us is that when kind of similar to uranium, when the world's largest producer is having some production issues, irrespective of a strength in price, it tells you that the supply response, um, irrespective of higher prices, comes with challenges. There have also been other mines recently that have either closed or announced some production uh, shortfalls or some, some anticipated shortfalls. I think the most significant is obviously the, the first quantum mine in Panama, which has basically closed, which is somewhere around two to three percent of global production. Um, Zambia is another big producer of of copper, and the government there is having challenges with electricity production, which is uh, which is uh, affecting the output of of the mining industry. So, we you know we definitely have had some production challenges, and I think because we are in a tight supply right now. It is having um, a ripple effect, and we're seeing that right now in places like China. And and why everyone pays so close attention to China is the fact that over fifty percent of the copper eventually makes its way to China for either end use and processing. And there's an interesting stat that everybody watches. It's uh, called TCRCs. The acronym is called Treatment Charges and Refining Charges, and these are the charges that smelters in China will charge the copper producers for their concentrate, which is basically a, a lower ore grade uh, kind of pre, pre-step, so to speak, in terms of the refining process. And just recently, the prices that the copper smelters are charging the producers have collapsed. And the reason why the prices have collapsed is because there's a shortage of, of copper concentrate. And that, I think, is a direct result of uh, some of the production hiccups and, and, and the mine in Panama closing. But also, I think the demand for copper has been really resilient, irrespective of a soft Chinese real estate market, uh, ener you know, energy transition related industries have been very durable. So these treatment charges, it's quite interesting because if you go back in time, um, historically, when they fall below $30 a ton, uh, and this came from the Bank of Montreal, they looked at the three last occasions this has happened and the subsequent three month return for copper has been in the range of 10 to 24 percent. And sure enough, copper is starting to break out. It just, you know, breached the nine thousand dollar a metric ton price. So I think right now in the in the in immediate near term, uh, we clearly have some shortages of copper and it is reflecting through the supply chain right now. Yeah, and you raised a very good point about the geopolitical aspect of what happened with First Quantum in Panama. That mine is completely shut down. A few years ago, we had issues, too, with Rio Tinto's OT mine in Mongolia. That's up and running now. They've resolved those issues. But geopolitics plays a huge part. And what's happening in recent years is that these larger companies like BHP and Rio Tinto have to go to these more challenging environments where sometimes the risk of supply um becomes a major risk. And um, further to that point, Barrick recently announced that they're going to go into Pakistan and develop one of the world's largest undeveloped copper gold projects in Rico Deek. And um, once again, in a very challenging environment, but this is what miners have to do now. 
Yeah, and it's a function of how long we've been mining copper. Um, we've been mining it for thousands of years, which means all the easy stuff close to surface has, for the large part, been found and mined. Um, copper has always played a key role in, you know, in the in the in terms of its use with, you know, in alloys in terms of mixing it with other metals. There's one organization that has estimated. Now I, I don't know how they ever estimated this, but they estimated that since the uh, the beginning of time. Uh, mankind has mined about 700 million metric tons of copper. And they also estimated between now and 2050, if we are going to realize some of the very aggressive net zero and energy transition related goals that have been announced, uh, they estimate, estimate that we would need 1.4 billion tons of copper between now and 2040. So two times as much copper that we've ever mined in, in, uh, in the you know, starting of time which is a huge challenge because as, as you said, you know, it's, you're having to go farther afield and sometimes in countries that are not typical, you know, mining jurisdictions or, you know, present additional uh, risks to companies. And, and that is a challenge. We're going to have to uh, go further afield and, and, um, and broaden our search at the same time, you know, copper mining is, is generally resisted uh, along with other forms of, of, of mining. So, even though we might have deposits in in tier one jurisdictions, uh, sometimes it's just been very difficult to get social license or environmental permits to actually produce the copper. And John, as we wrap up, when you look at the demand for copper and which is increasing significantly due to the growth in EVs and also solar and and also uh, wind turbines. And then you look at the constraints associated with supply and also the jurisdictional issues. It looks like the price of copper is gonna go significantly higher. Do you care to put a price on it? Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to obviously predict, but you know, one thing we, we need to remind people is that the price of copper, which you know was around $9,000 a metric ton back in 2010, I mean, it, it went down all the way down to 4,000. A metric ton and meandered there for for a while and so when you get these periods where a commodity is languishing for an extended period of time you don't have a lot of in investor interest you don't have a lot of investment you know the, the the expiration development cycle grinds to a halt and then you have a shift in the world which is decarbonization and you find out hey we need a lot of this metal and there are very long lead times to bring these projects to market they're also very large in terms of the scale and the cost to bring them to market. And, you know, if you listen to some of the CEOs of the major mining companies, I think it's really interesting. Two things that really stick out to me. One, they've all messaged how important copper is going to be for their business and how strategically they're focused on it. Whether they're, they're a diversified mining company or in some cases, even a very long established gold mining company, they're all saying the same thing, which is, we want to bulk up the exposure in our portfolio to copper. I think that is really bullish because, you know, they don't make these decisions lightly. They look at the long-term fundamentals. They know the timelines and the amount of capital will have to be deployed. Uh, the second thing they're saying is, look, a $4 a pound copper price isn't going to cut it in terms of a new large-scale greenfield project. And you've, you've heard CEOs say, look, the price probably needs to be closer to $6 a pound for some of these projects to get built. And I, I think we would concur with that, that the price needs to be uh, substantially higher. Now, the timeline it takes uh, is impossible to know, but I go back to uranium. You know, three years ago, the price of uranium was $30. Everyone knew there was a supply deficit and a structural de deficit that needed to be solved. And our thesis was very simple. You only can solve that through higher prices. As the market kind of pieced that together, we've obviously seen higher prices. And I think I think a similar kind of story is going to play out. Now, copper is obviously a much bigger market than uranium, so it's I don't think it's going to be as as volatile as say the uranium market's been the last few years. But I think generally the way to solve these things is through higher prices. It's the only way. And the, I guess the last thing I'm going to wrap up with is just in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of excitement about copper and artificial intelligence. And you might say, well, what do those two things have to do with each other? And it's interesting because there's so much excitement about, about AI right now, and they, they require a very intensive, energy intensive, um, you know, data warehouses and, and, and servers and, and whatnot. 
And you're starting to hear messaging from some of the big companies, including NVIDIA, who's the leader in this area, saying that for their data centers, they're going to, they're going to uh, migrate away from using fiber optics to copper because it requires less electricity use, more energy efficient. And that got the, the market all excited because everyone's excited about, about the role AI and data centers and the cloud and all these things are, are going to have in terms of electricity demand over the coming decades, which if you look at electricity demand in the United States, it's essentially been flat for 15 to 20 years. And many of the utilities in the US are saying, hey, our customers are telling us they need more electricity in the coming years to uh, power everything from data centers, AI, a lot of manufacturing related to energy transition technologies, reshoring of manufacturing. Uh, so we think copper is, is getting kind of a boost here from not just energy transition, but also new technologies like AI, which I think are really interesting. Interesting and very compelling uh, comments. John, if someone would like to learn more about the new Copper Miners ETF or other Sprott products, where can they go? Yeah, come to Sprott.com. We've got information about our funds. We also have an insights section and a podcast section. Uh, we have a number of, we have a white paper on Copper, which I'd recommend you have a look at. We also have some podcasts about Copper. Uh, and we're big advocates of investor education, which is why we do these, which why we do these interviews. We really want to empower investors to 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 make informed decisions with their investments. Great comments, John, and thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you for having me. Hi, Charlie. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Houston? Hi, Jimmy. It's good to be here. The sun is shining in Houston. Perfect weather today. And it's Friday. <laughs> Things starting to warm up? Absolutely. The weather's getting warm and it's about to get summer hot. So enjoying the, the relief while we have it. So BHP is one of the largest mining companies in the world, employing over 80,000 people in 90 locations globally. And you hit up the accelerator program called BHP Explore. Can you just provide a brief overview of this program and what was the catalyst for starting it? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the catalyst for starting BHP Explore. The, the reason behind it and the driving force is really the global energy transition. We all know the stats on how much more copper and nickel we need to have. It's multiples of what we have today in a very short amount of time. So we need to find those resources faster and that all starts with exploration. So how do we think about exploration differently is, is the question that was asked. And so we looked outside of our industry um, that is mining um, and we looked to venture capital in our case and, and looked at a way and a new of a new business model, which is the accelerator business model, to invest in early stage companies in a way that can accelerate them. And through BHP Explore, which is the accelerator model, um, what we've done is we've re-engineered re it in a way that is custom fit for minerals exploration. That brings me to the overview of BHP Explore. So BHP Explore accelerator business model, we are looking for early stage minerals ex explorers, commonly known as junior explorers. And what we've built is a program that includes not only funding, but a support model and um, program that helps take those early stage geologic ideas and early stage businesses and, and accelerate them in a way that sets them up to be able to get investment, explore, and hopefully we'll get to those eventual discoveries in the very near, near future. Yes, I have to admit it's a brilliant idea by BHP and I'm surprised more mining companies are not doing the same thing. Now, will you and your team only look at private companies or public companies or will you look at both? We look at both private and public companies. So as we know, the financing challenge is real for this type of um, early stage exploration. And so we welcome in both public and private. In both years of our cohorts, we have about a split ratio of public to private. So this year we have six companies in the cohort, three are public, three are private. 
No, you raise a very good point there because raising capital in this environment has been very challenging to the state of the least. So now what about jurisdictions? As we know, mining can be quite challenging at times, depending on what region or country you're in. Do you are there any countries or jurisdictions that you would shy away from? Explore searches globally for the big new exploration ideas. Our only limitation is sanctioned countries. But other than that, we are open globally. Um, to ideas in all jurisdictions. And the program is called BHP Explorer, which would imply that you only work with exploration companies, but what about more developed projects like developers? As of now, um, we're in our second year and we are strictly focused on exploration opportunities at the moment. Um, so definitely the earlier stage explorers and um, exploration concepts. And maybe you can just share some of the qualities you're looking for in a company. Sure. So last year we received over 500 applications to the um, Explore program, and we assessed all of them on um, a, a criteria set that spans across a couple of different dimensions. Um, the first of which being the technical merit of the opportunity. Um, when we look at the um, geology and um, the concepts behind it, we're looking for the potential for scale. So what we want to see these projects um, turn into the eventual world-class mines that would be uh, a part of the BHP portfolio in the future. And so the first test is, can we see the potential for scale? Um, the second is the teams behind it, um, because if you to have a good project and to be able to explore it, you have to have the right team behind it. Um, so we do some pretty, um, we have a pretty rigorous selection process that includes, it starts with the application, but it ends with an interview because we want to meet the people behind the opportunities and the programs ahead to explore. And the going through 500 applications, that must be a very laborious process. How many months does that take? The selection process, as we call it, is definitely one of the more intense periods of the explore cycle, um, but it is deliberately built to be fast. So our application period last year ran for seven weeks, and we had decisions made in less than six. So we have a pretty, um, pretty structured system that we work all applications through that allows us to screen the applications, um, get to a subset that we meet with all teams virtually, and then we take a select few through interviews and get to our selection decisions pretty quick. And when you talk about BHP scale, maybe you can quantify that for us. Are you talking about daily tonnage or are you talking about mine life or what exactly? Um, we are, we're talking about mine life um, and the world-class projects that would um, make it into the BHP portfolio in the future. And you made mention of the fact that you went through 500 applications, but only six were successful this year. And um, I'm surprised that it was so few. Why would that be? So BHP Explorer is in, still in our, only in our second year um, of the program. The first year we proved that it was a success. First, that there was a demand for what we were doing. And secondly, that we had a very high quality program um, that delivered value to the seven participants we had in year one. In year two, we saw double the number of applications, um, but we held our quality standards um, still to pretty high levels, not only in the opportunities we brought in, but in the quality standards that we hold ourselves to, to be able to deliver a, a really um, high class accelerator program. Um, the opportunities that we brought in this year, um, we make a commitment to each that we see a path to a future um, with the inside the BHP portfolio. It's not a guarantee, though. So what we commit is that through our program that we deliver, that each company and project will be more likely for investment coming out um, than where they started. And that investment may come from BHP. Um, it may come from the external markets, but what we wanted to make sure we could do um, with our small team that is BHP Explorer is still deliver a really high quality program over the course of that six months to live up to that commitment. And maybe you can just expand on what services BHP will offer the successful candidates. 
Sure. So over the six months of the BHP Explore program, each company receives a U.S. $500,000 grant that's issued over the course of the program. And then in addition to that, we have the program itself that is inclusive of in-person events and virtual masterclasses. We um, build this around the fundamentals of minerals exploration. So we, we say that it's like a mini MBA for minerals explorers. We have elements of um, technical um, underpinned by our mineral systems framework, operational readiness, which is focused on above ground and operational risks, and business strategy and fundament fundamentals. All of those things come together to support these companies and their projects um, to accelerate them to a point that they can get the investment that they need to explore. And if you like the progress that a company has made in six months, will you make a follow-up or a follow-on investment? So the intent behind Explore is to position all of the companies that come in um, for investment at the end of the program. And that investment may, may be from BHP, it may be from the external markets, but what we commit to them is that through our program, um, their companies, their projects are going to be investable at the end. Charlie, as we wrap up, if you could give one piece of advice to a junior exploration company who has an interest in applying to the BHP Explore program, what would it be? My advice to the junior explorers thinking about Explore is to think big and think differently. That's what we've done with Explore and this new model that we've built for partnership with um, between BHP and the, the junior exploration industry. Um, we've, we've definitely thought different about how we can come together for future partnerships. And I ask that you do the same. Um, think big about your ideas, think boldly about how you explore them and um, come see us at BHP Explore. And where can people go to find more information about the program? Visit our website at www.bhp.com backslash explore. Well, that was a great overview. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thanks, Jimmy. Pleasure being here. Well, that concludes another conference. And I want to thank all of our company participants and our corporate sponsor, Sprott Inc. We have some amazing conferences coming up in the coming weeks. So be sure to subscribe to our channel. Blur Street Capital, and also hit that notification button to be kept up to date on upcoming events. Once again, I want to thank you for your support.